lead pastor here at the well. I'm so glad you've joined us today as we kick off our new series, Friend of Sinners. And the church has tried to explain sin and the impact of sin and the reality of sin in a variety of ways, especially to kids. And I wanted to go over a few of those today because maybe they're familiar to you. And the whole point of them is to try to help us understand that sin is a reality and what sin does to us. And so one of the examples that I've heard is sin is kind of like if you're very thirsty and you want a glass of water and someone goes to hand you a glass of water, but instead it has a rotten egg in it. You know, and you think, well, so they're trying to get it like the contamination of sin, that sin contaminates our lives. It takes something that's good and makes it not so good. Uh, another way that I've heard the reality and the impact of sin explained is it's kind of like you were like a whole cookie and then sin came along and you became this crumbled up cookie. And so now you're just a bunch of cookie crumbs and thank God that Jesus will come along and do something good with your crumbled up life. So it, you know, they're trying to get at the fact that sin really it ruins things, you know. And then another way that I've heard sin explained is it's kind of like, you know, your heart gets filled with dirt. And so you've got this dirt and then you try to like cover that up like this sugar here with like good deeds. You know, you try to counter it and you put like good things into your life. But the truth is like it just gets mixed in and it still looks like dirt, you know, and they're trying to get at that sin kind of pollutes things. And all of this is to show that sin is something that we maybe shouldn't be attracted to. It's not something that we should desire, that we shouldn't, you know, try to order our lives around it, that it's damaging, that it's polluting. Uh, but really, the teaching often behind it is to show that sin is somehow repulsive, you know, that we should be repulsed by it, but also that God is repulsed by sin. And maybe many of you have been taught that, that God is so holy, he can't stand to be in the presence of sin, and so it pushes him away. He must turn away from it. And, you know, there's lots of verses that maybe you have in your mind when that comes to mind. Uh, but one of them is Isaiah 59, verse 2. It is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen to you anymore. And so this idea that sin is repulsive to God, but it's not too far of a line to draw from, like, sin is repulsive to God to sinners are repulsive to God. And again, the teaching is often you, a human, are infected with sin. And so sin is something that's so repulsive to God that he cannot stand to be in your presence as long as sin is part of your nature. And those who are saved, it's that Jesus, they, Jesus is put on. You know? And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see you anymore. He sees Jesus because Jesus is acceptable, but you are not. And this is, how, this is often how the gospel has been framed around that you are not worthy, you are not good. It has to start with you thinking very lowly of yourself. Charles Spurgeon, he said this, I feel myself to be a lump of unworthiness, a mass of corruption, a heap of sin, all rottenness, a dunghill of corruption, nothing better, and a great deal worse. And so this idea of like, you have to see yourself as worthless, as terrible, that sin has made you something that is repulsive, and, and then we frame the gospel around that. And John Piper said, it, it horribly skews the meaning of the cross when contemporary prophets of self-esteem say that the cross is a witness to my infinite worth. The biblical perspective is that the cross is a witness to the infinite worth of God's glory and a witness to the immensity of the sin of my pride. And so only God is worthy, and we should look at the, the cross and see how un worthy we are, how, how far we fall from God's goodness. And this naturally leads, when we start to see that God is repulsed by sinners, God is repulsed by sin, and that we are not worthy, it leads to a fear of drawing close to God. Because all humans have a natural uh, protection around feeling rejected, around feeling punished. And so drawing close to a God who you feel doesn't like you very much is very hard. And again, this has been taught throughout the church. John Calvin said, there is no reason why we should feel safe when God declares himself opposed to and angry with us. And he's right. If you believe that God is opposed to you, that God is angry with you, that God is quick to punish you, that God views you as repulsive, why would you draw close to a God like that? It would be very wise to keep that God at an arm's length and not get too close because that God is only going to hurt you and find you un worthy. But we have to ask, is that the right picture of God? Is that the right picture of God's attitude toward sin, that God is repulsed by us, that God is repulsed 
by sin, that he can't stand to be in the presence of it. And we name this series Friend of Sinners because we believe that Jesus paints a different picture. He paints a different picture of God, which therefore helps paint a different picture of us. Brian Zond, I love this quote. He says, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. God is like Jesus. And he goes on to say, Jesus is what God has to say. I love that. Jesus is what God has to say. And sometimes, you know, because we all get infected with that view that God is a mean being that's looking to judge us. When I read the Gospels, I replace the word Jesus with the word God to remind myself that Jesus is what God has to say. That what Jesus does is what God does. That is God's heart. Jesus says, if you want to see the Father, you look at me. We're one in the same. And so over this series, we're going to look at a number of interactions that Jesus has with sinners and what it shows us about sin and what sin does to our lives and how we should respond, but also what God thinks of us, even those of us who are sinners. And so our first interaction today, it is actually found in all three synoptic gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we're going to look at the Lucan account today, and you're going to see there's a reason why it shows up in all three. It's a pretty memorable story. So it starts in Luke 5, verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village in Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And so Jesus' ministry has started at this point. He has gone and found his disciples. He has started healing people. He's made declarations about him being a Messiah and his teaching. And so word has gotten around. And so these religious leaders, they show up from all over to check him out. And we've got the Pharisees, and that word Pharisee means set apart one or holy one. And they were lay leaders who were experts in the Mosaic law. And their whole point, their whole point of belief was that Israel was under Roman occupation because they had not adhered to the Mosaic law. They were not pure enough, they were not serious enough, they were not strict enough, and if only they would get their act together and follow the rules and do what it is that God had asked them to do, then God would restore his presence and restore Israel. And then you have the teachers of the law, sometimes known as scribes, sometimes it's translated as lawyers, and they were part of the temple system, and they were the interpreters of the law. They would come in and they would say, well, this is how the law needs to be followed. They would make decrees, and those decrees had to be followed. So we've got some big power brokers here watching Jesus, trying to figure out what's going on with him. And Luke makes this statement, the power of the Lord was on Jesus. And this is not a one-time thing. It's not like on this day, the power of the Lord was with, was with Jesus, and the other days, it was not. It's that he's making a statement about the authority of Jesus's ministry. And that same phrasing, the power of the Lord, to do something, to accomplish something, is used when God rescues Israel from Egypt, from slavery. So that's the same power. So Luke is making a declaration about the authority of Jesus's ministry. It comes from the power of the Lord. And our story continues. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles to the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up take your mat and go home. And immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. And everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. And so these friends, they are desperate to get their friend in front of Jesus. They can't get through the crowd. So they go over the crowd and lower their friend through the roof and in the middle of Jesus teaching, right? They're moving tiles. You know, uh, other accounts talk about them digging 
through the roof as well. And so you can only imagine Jesus standing there and there's like dust falling down. I mean, imagine right now, here I am teaching and someone just lowers themselves through the roof, you know, right in front of me. And you're like, what? It'd be pretty memorable, right? It's humorous. It's memorable. It's why we have this account in three gospels, because it's something that you would want to include. It's pretty over the top. And Jesus, he looks at this guy and he forgives his sins, which would have been surprising to everyone because these guys didn't lower their friend through the mat because they through the roof because they're thinking, you know what we want? We want Jesus to declare his sins forgiven. They want him to be healed, right? That's what they're thinking. And he says, your sins are forgiven. And the, the, the leaders there, they start to grumble. Who does this guy think he is? He's blaspheming. And that word blaspheming means to slander God's name. He's slandering God's name. And Jesus, he challenges them says, I know what your thoughts are. And we don't know. The Greek is not clear as to whether it's, you know, they're saying it out loud or whether it's thoughts in their heart. But either way, Jesus is aware. And he's like, well, which is easier? You know what? Get up and walk. And the man gets up. He walks and he's rejoicing. And everyone is rejoicing. They're praising God. They're in awe. And they say, we have seen remarkable things today. And that word remarkable doesn't just mean like, wow, miracle. It is paradoxus is in the, in the Greek. You hear it? paradox. There's something that is so unexpected. It totally shifts their paradigm. This is not what they ever would have seen, what they ever would have expected. And so we have to stop and go, oh, well, if, if Jesus is what God has to say, what has happened in this moment? What is the magnitude of this moment that changes everything about how we understand who God is and who we are? What is the remarkable thing that Jesus has done. And the first remarkable thing that Jesus does is how he receives this paralyzed man. Because as this man is lowered before him, this would have been someone who would have been considered a sinner. You know, it was common assumption if you are deformed in any way, it is because of God's judgment on your life. There is sin in your life, and he would have been excluded from not just the community, but also the temple, from the worshiping community. In Leviticus, it says this, the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, none of your future descendants who have some kind of imperfection are allowed to offer, offer their God's food. No one who has an imperfection will be allowed to make an offering. This includes anyone who is blind, crippled, disfigured, or, disform, or deformed. And so this man, he would not be allowed in the temple. He would not be allowed to make sacrifices to God. He would not be allowed to go through the rituals of atonement and forgiveness. His very presence, his physical presence would have been considered repulsive, unpleasing to God, not good enough, not worthy. And so you would expect that here, if Jesus is God, he would be offended by this man to be in his presence. But that's not what we see. Jesus greets this man with the term friend, and that's a term of endearment, but it also means human. It means human. And here is this man for most of his life who has not been treated like a human, who has been on the outskirts of society where people think less of him, people walk past him, people don't acknowledge him, he can't participate, and Jesus turns to him and he rehumanizes him. He's not offended. Who put this sinner in front of me? Don't you know who I am? I'm the Messiah. He greets him with endearment, and we see Jesus do this over and over again. Right before this interaction, Jesus healed the leper by touching him, and right after this interaction, Jesus is going to go eat with sinners and tax collectors. And so what we see, if Jesus is what God has to say, the first thing that we see in Jesus is God is not repulsed by sin. God is not repulsed by sin because Jesus doesn't walk around. He doesn't come to, to the earth and be like, all of you are sinners. This is so terrible. Get out of I can't even be in your presence, it's so repulsive. Jesus is not repulsed by sin or sinners. Jesus is drawn to sinners. Jesus acknowledges them. He greets them. He eats with them. He welcomes them. He, he treats them with dignity and worth. That is what God has to say in Jesus. So that's the first remarkable thing that Jesus does. But the second remarkable thing that Jesus does is how he forgives this man's sins. Because he sees their faith, and again, we're not sure if it's the faith of the friends or the faith of the man and the friends. It's not really clear in the Greek there, but he sees their faith, and he turns to this man. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven, and the religious leaders are like just in an uproar. They cannot believe they're besides themselves about what's just happened because Jesus has made claims that he's the Messiah. That's why they are there checking him out, being like, what's going on? with this guy here, and he is not following any of the rules. 
he is going rogue. One, humans don't have the authority to forgive people's sins. They can forgive someone who has directly sinned against them, but they don't just forgive sins. Not even the high priest forgave sins. God alone forgave sins. The high priest mediated God's forgiveness, but it wasn't the priest who forgave you. It was always God. And Jesus isn't saying God forgives you of your sins. He says, I forgive you of your sins. So he's making a claim. That's why they're saying he's blaspheming God's name. But also there's no ritual because it's very clear. You don't just get forgiven. You're supposed to go through all these motions, right? You're supposed to be at a specific place. A specific person is supposed to do this ritual. There's specific materials that are needed. There's a whole process. There's things you say and that they say, and that is how you atone for sin. But Jesus doesn't observe any of that. He, in his own authority, forgives this man, and he doesn't make him go through any of the motions. The guy doesn't even ask to be forgiven. He doesn't get lowered. He's like, hey, Jesus, could you forgive me my sins? He doesn't even ask. So all of this is wrong. But if Jesus is what God has to say, then the second thing we see is that God does not need ritual to forgive sin. God has never needed ritual to forgive sin. We needed ritual to feel forgiven for sin. And God graciously accommodated us in that moment. But God has never been limited that we have to go through certain motions, that we have to follow certain rules in order to be forgiven God doesn't need ritual to forgive sin. Jesus is forgiving sin before he even goes to the cross. So we don't need the cross even to be forgiven of sin. That's not what the cross is about because we, in, this, in this interaction, we see the beginning of the remarkable thing, the third remarkable thing that Jesus is doing that is made full on the cross. But the third remarkable thing that God tells us is God wants to release us from our sin. Is that word forgive also means release. To forgive is to release. And so when the religious leaders see this, this you know, rogue Messiah forgiving sins and start to challenge him, Jesus turns to them and says, which one's easier? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. And you think the first one's easier to say, right? Because you can't see s- sin forgiven. It's not like this guy like turned purple or a green light went over him where he's like, oh, he's a forgiven one. You can't see it. And even then, he's challenging this idea that this man is crippled because of his sin, right? He, he's saying, it looks like it's easier to say that, but then he says, get up and walk. The truth is, neither are easy to actually say. They both require the exact same power. They both require the power of God. And so Jesus, in doing that, in linking this man's forgiveness and this man's healing, he's saying, I have the authority to heal, I have the authority to heal physically, and I have the authority to heal spiritually. And that is what his ministry is all about, is release, is freedom. When he inaugurates his ministry, the chapter before this in Luke chapter 4, he goes to his hometown synagogue, and we read this. When Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your, heal- in your hearing. Jesus very intentionally picks his passage here, and it is a passage of release. It is a passage of freedom, of setting captives free, of restoring sight to the blind, but he leaves off a line that everybody would have known was coming because he says, here I am to, to declare the year of the Lord's favor, but the very next line is, and the day of the Lord's, of the vengeance of our God. And he comes to say, I'm not here to preach vengeance. The Messiah isn't here to bring punishment about sin. He's here to bring freedom, release from sin. He, everybody would have known that that's what would have come next, and he doesn't read it because Jesus isn't here for vengeance. And so the cross is about forgiveness, but it is not forgiveness in that you are no longer offensive to God. Right? That's what we think about. Oh, Jesus has forgiven our sins, so God is no longer offended by us. He's no longer repulsed by us. We're not just like this dirt with trying to put some sugar in it. He's cleaning us up. But God was forgiving sins before the cross. 
There was ways to be forgiven. There was ways to make atonement before Jesus went to the cross. It just never stuck, right? You, you get forgiven, and then you'd be back in the same place, and you'd be back in the same place. We, we don't need the cross to be forgiven so that we're no longer offensive. We need the cross to be forgiven so that we are released, so that we are set free, so that the debt is paid to set captives free. Brian Zahn says it like this. It wasn't God who was alienated toward the world. It was the world that was alienated toward God. Jesus didn't die on the cross to change God's mind about us. Jesus died on the cross to change our minds about God. See, here's the thing. And too often we think about this, the gospel this way, and we've been taught that the gospel is this, that God was so angry about sin. He's so enraged about sin that he had this murderous rage and he was going to kill you. It's like this oncoming train of God's rage. But Jesus stepped in front of it and saved you and he took the blow instead. But that's not the picture that we get of God. It is not that God is so enraged by sin that he was going to murder someone, so he murdered Jesus instead of you, and now he loves you. It's that we were so in the grip of sin that we are captive to sin that we need more than forgiveness. We need release. Paul says it like this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What happens on the cross is that Jesus becomes sin. He absorbs all of the power of sin, everything that sin has to throw at us. And the truth is, sin always leads to death. It's its ultimate tool. It's its ultimate weapon. It's death. And so when Jesus absorbs all sin, all the power of sin, and he dies, but then he, he defeats death, he defeats sin. He sets us free. And that's what the cross is about. It has come to set us free from sin so that we are no longer under its power. That, that is the same, same power that heals this man physically. It heals us spiritually. The release of sin has always been the plan so that we are set free once and for all. So if Jesus is what God has to say, then what is it that God's saying to us? When we look at Jesus, what do we see? Well, first, we don't see a God who is repulsed by us, who can't be in our presence, right, unless we're holding up a mirror so he can only see himself. We see a God who treats us with dignity and worth. We see a God who calls us friend. And we see a God that when we are in his presence, we experience freedom and healing. And so with that, we should take a note from this man, the paralytic, and his friends, because they were desperate to get in the presence of Jesus. They, were, they would do anything to get in the presence of Jesus. And we need that same desperation. Sometimes we are like the paralytic, meaning we feel like we're outsiders. We feel like we don't belong. We feel like we've been told over and over again that maybe we're not good enough or life just keeps knocking us down or things are confusing. And this guy couldn't get himself in the presence of Jesus. He couldn't get himself there. He needed other people to get him there. And even when he got there, he didn't ask for anything. Either sometimes, when they don't know, maybe he was paralyzed that he couldn't speak, or Jesus just got to it first. But either way, his friends were the ones who helped get him to Jesus. They were his stretcher bearers. And sometimes we can't get ourselves into the presence of Jesus. Sometimes we can't get there because we feel too hopeless. Sometimes we feel too worn down. Sometimes we feel too sad or too confused or too broken or too worthless. And that we don't have enough trust that we can get there and that God's going to love us or accept us. And we need others to carry us there. And that is why we need stretcher bearers. And we need a community of stretcher bearers. And we need them per interpersonally, but we need them bigger than that. I know when I was going through, we went through four years of infertility, and I was a pastor during that time, and it just rubs you raw. It, it is nothing makes you more confused, more heartbroken, more sad, where every month your, your hopes are dashed, and year after year after year, and towards the end of that four years, I was just broken, and I, I was so confused and angry and sad and I would show up to church, and I couldn't sing the songs. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it, but I let everyone else sing them for me. And I rested that I don't feel this right now, but they do. And I'm going to rest in their belief. I'm going to borrow their faith. And we need one another for those moments. 
And maybe you're in that place, and maybe you need someone to help bring you to the presence of Jesus, and you don't even know what to ask. And that's okay because others can trust for you that Jesus knows what you need. And so do you have stretcher bearers in your life? Do you have people to carry you there when you can't get there yourself for whatever reason? And then we also need to learn from his friends because they were desperate. They were willing to do things that were offensive and crazy. They were willing to be chastised and rejected to get their friend at the feet of Jesus because they trusted that he was worth doing that all for. They trusted that he was the one who was going to help them, help their friend, and restore him. And for us, sometimes we are called to be stretcher bearers for other people, that we have to trust in Jesus for those who cannot. Because sometimes we have people in our lives who they don't believe in Jesus. Or maybe they don't want to draw near to God because they've been hurt by a faith community. Maybe they feel worn down or hopeless. Maybe they've just been knocked down by life a few too many times. And truthfully, if we're honest, we often see prayer as a last resort or like, oh, you know, I'll pray for you, but it feels powerless. You know, like I can't solve it, but I'll pray for you. And it, and it feels good when we can tangibly do something to help others. And Jesus is really clear. Like if someone's hungry, you don't just say you're going to pray for them. You get your food and you share it with them. You know, you, you do what you can physically, but we shouldn't see prayer as a, like, I can't do anything else. So I guess I'll pray. Prayer is bringing someone to the presence of Jesus. And I was putting this together. I was reminded, you know, I have someone in my life right now who I love very much who is struggling with mental health. And it is a, it's brutal. You know, when you see someone and, and they hurt and you can't solve it. And some of you have that in your life. People who are in the grips of addiction or mental health or poverty or just physical ailments. And I had to remind myself, this person, they don't have the faith yet to get themselves to the presence of Jesus. But I can. I can, and it makes a difference. I can be a stretcher bearer for them. And so who in your life needs you to trust in Jesus when they can't do it for themselves? Because Jesus is what God has to say. Jesus is what God has to say to us. And James Bryan Smith, he sums it up well. He says, the incarnation is proclaiming to you and me that we matter to God. We bear God's image, the fact Jesus became human, affirms that all human lives matter, that we are all of inestimable worth, even in the midst of our failings and faults and peculiarities. The you that is you, uniquely you, matters to God. What we see in Jesus, what God has to say in Jesus is he calls you friend. First and foremost, he calls you friend. He looks at you with endearment and care, and he loves you. He's not repulsed by you. He doesn't see you as some crumbled up cookie or a heart full of dirt or something that's contaminated. You are precious to him. You are precious to him. And God wants to set you free. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to release you from sin. And when we keep that in mind, why would we not be desperate to get into his presence? Why would we not be desperate to get those that we love into his presence? Because he is a friend of sinners. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're so grateful for you and who you are. We're grateful for the ways that you care for us and love us. And we're grateful, Jesus, that you call us friend first. That you want to restore us and redeem us, that you want to release us, God, that you, you're not repulsed by us. So for those of us who maybe feel far from you and we can't get ourselves there, we feel paralyzed in life. Would you bring stretcher bearers around us, God? Those who trust in your goodness and your love who will do anything to get them in your presence, God. And for those of us who are are called to be stretcher bearers right now. Would you help us be faithful in that, God, to not see prayer as a last resort, but as a first resort, to trust that you know what they need more than we know what they need, and that your love for them is so vast and so big and so good that we can trust you for them. We pray this in Jesus' name.